Hey, Bob, good to be back with you again. We are. <laughs> These are our outtakes. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Restore the Glory podcast. My name is Jake Kim. And I'm Bob Schutz. We're two Catholic therapists sharing what we've learned personally and professionally to help you on the journey of restoration. If you've been blessed by our podcast, please prayerfully consider partnering with us on Patreon. Your support will help cover the cost to produce the podcast, but will also give you access to exclusive content like monthly reflections and special live stream teachings. Go to patreon.com slash restore the glory and join the mission of experiencing the restoration of our God-given glory. Hey, Bob, good to be back with you again. We are here in our marriage series again. Um, it's been great. We've gotten gone through an introduction episode, and then we've talked about spiritual unity, emotional intimacy, and we've got uh, an episode today is coming up is on companionship and teamwork, and then we'll finish off the series on sexual intimacy. And again, just for our listeners to give a, some context, this is all coming out of Bob's book, be Devoted, as well as their marriage conference that John Paul II Healing Center does called Unveiled. And so if you want to dive into this more, we'd recommend those resources and uh, attending one of those events. But so far, Bob, this has been really good and just reflecting on these various things. And I always appreciate a chart. You know, when you see something in a, in a book or a workshop or whatever, charts just, you know, how you synthesize the information. And so for our Patreon listeners, we'll be showing them this chart and, you know, breaking it all down a little bit more for them. So that was a shameless plug for Patreon, wasn't it? I just slipped that in there. <laughs> okay. So companionship and teamwork is where we're going right now. So our scripture for today to get us launched off is from Philippians chapter 2, verses two to four and it says complete my joy by being of the same mind with the same love united in heart thinking one thing do nothing out of selfishness or out of vain glory rather humbly regard others as more important than yourselves each looking out not for his own interests bob what strikes you about the scripture as we dive in here that is so rich, that scripture uh, is talking about the church, but the application in marriage is unmistakable because it is what marriage is about, uh, becoming yeah. one of mind and heart. And I think about uh, a quote that I heard from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he says, if you, if you try to have unity without love, you will destroy unity. But if you mm -hmm. focus on love, you will find unity. And, you know, love comes when we look out for each other's interests. You know, it's, it's willing the good of the other. Right. And, and this is all what companionship and teamwork is about, is looking out for each other's interests. Because if I'm looking out for my interest, you know, I, I think about early on wanting to do sports together with Margie. And so I got right. her a tennis racket for her birthday, and we yeah. went out and played tennis. And it was my interest more than her interest. And she was a good sport. She was looking out for my interest, but I wasn't looking out for hers. Hmm. And, uh, you know, just the, the challenge in marriage is how do I look out for my spouse's interest? And as I do that, that brings us into unity. That brings us into to becoming one mind and one heart uh, in a lot of different ways. I mean, we're going to talk about all that as we go through this episode. But uh, that's what strikes me immediately. How about you? What jumps out at me right away, and I, it's not intentional, is how woundedness is underneath the reasons why you can't look out for the other one's interests. You know, mm -hmm. because I can just, I see it in my own life and other people where if I have a dynamic in my heart that then causes me to see Heather uh, wrong, and then bitterness grows. Then when it comes time to actually connect and do things together, right? You you don't want you to don't because want to. you're you're you all you see is the bitterness and the wounds, uh, but maybe you don't even know that. And so then going and having fun together, right? It, it's like I don't want to have fun. And so I think another thing that's just a subtle now. This may be a little bit of a deeper cut here, real quick. Is I think sometimes um, there's this phrase in, in psychotherapy and in counseling, especially in attachment theory, that kids often are 
they're the rudest or the meanest to the people they feel most safe with. And that a lot of parents get thrown by that concept when they have kids acting out with them, but they'll go to school and they're perfectly behaved. And a lot of that has to do with fear. They're more afraid at school. They're less afraid at home. And so it's this weird dynamic, I feel like sometimes where sometimes people feel in a marriage that they're there, it's okay all of a sudden to be more rude. And it's this weird twist where they actually might feel the safest in that relationship, but that is a horrible way to communicate their safety, you know? And so it just makes me think about this again is one of those areas where you can see the dynamics underneath the surface pretty clear when it's hard to engage in, you know, companionship or in teamwork. Now, sometimes it's just opposites. You know, that's the first thing. That's the other thing that comes to mind. Like I would say that's Heather and I, we, man, we are tomato, tomato in so many areas, but that doesn't have to actually uh, break it down for, for it. it doesn't have to cause disruption. And so maybe I'll just continue on with the story. Then we can dive a bit deeper here, uh, into companionship. I just said it, but Heather and I are very different. We are very different. I mean, I would watch sports all day and do that kind of thing. Heather is a, you know, this is going to come out wrong, but she's like a pub girl. And that's kind of the narrative in my head. She would love to go to a pub, have a beer and chat all night long with friends and community or have them over to the house, et cetera. So when people come over, I'm sitting there going, what game can we play? And she's like, why are you distracting people with a game? Let's just visit. And it's not bad, but we're very, very different in that area. And so One of the things that Heather has done so well at is that it's so playful and fun and she's so awesome at it is she knows I love college football. Mm -hmm. And so coming from the, I grew up in Alabama, Tennessee. So, uh, I, I'm college football is a big deal. Right. And so, man, I almost started talking, almost like said roll tide and war Eagle and all those things. So anyway, a little shout out for all my Alabama family and friends. So Heather picked that Notre Dame is her favorite team. Now, she doesn't have a clue about anything about Notre Dame football, but she just went, oh, yeah, Notre Dame's my team. <laughs> and so she's just playing, right? She's just engaging in it with me, and it's so it's so sweet and cute. And so I'll say to her, Notre Dame's on, and she goes, oh, I know, I know, they're going to win. You know, <laughs> she's just playing along. And then I think one time she did a Google search of what's one player on Notre Dame <laughs> so she could throw their name out and, and shock me. It was It was awesome. And so... Anyway, that was just a great example of her sharing in my interests and her looking out for my interests and engaging in them with me, right? She'll sit down and watch like the national championship with me. Yeah. Um, and it's just sweet. So, yeah, that's great. I, I think you're uh, Heather and Margie would have been good friends because Margie <laughs> would love hanging out in the pub and talking to and listening to music and yeah. all that. And yeah, although Margie loved to watch football. Uh, did she? So, yeah, she did. Uh, Love to watch football. She was a cheerleader, so she kind of was around sports all those times. But we really had trouble finding areas of companionship. Huh. You know, things that we really enjoyed doing together. Right. Um, she enjoyed shopping. I didn't. I enjoyed playing sports. She enjoyed watching them. Uh, I would enjoy watching them too. Yeah. She would enjoy watching HGTV and things like that. And yeah. And so it was a very conscious thing later in our marriage as I matured some of sitting down next to her, watching HGTV, maybe rubbing her feet or something like that, just as a way of mm-hmm. connecting and being present. Those didn't come easy early in marriage. Those were, yeah. I was much more self-focused yeah. early in my marriage. Oh man. I, yeah. I'm still always working through the self-focus, but it's fun. I think they would have been really good friends because I'm like, man, that's all the stuff Heather likes to do. Maybe that's why we're good friends because when we get together, we talk sports and we have some intense cornhole matches and stuff. So that's always fun. So let's press a bit deeper here. In the chart that uh, we have here, so you've listed out, which is really, this is, you know, the beauty of charts. What are the obstacles and what are, how do we grow in it with regard to companionship? And then in a moment here, we'll get to teamwork. So Two things here as obstacles are isolation and selfishness. I feel like we're already touching on selfishness. And gosh, Bob, I feel like I just want to say to people out there, a little bit of selflessness can go so far, but so often we're so wrapped up in what I'm getting or not getting that we miss how far that little bit of selflessness can go. You know, like Heather just watching a game with me 
that went a long way. It was it was bonding for us, you know. Um, and me, like like you said, watching HTV TV a little bit or saying, Heather, do you want to have a beer? You know, I'm, that's not I'm not really an alcohol drinker, but she'll be like, wow, you know. So just it's it's good, you know, to get a little bit outside of yourself. But when you're selfish, man, companionship shuts down. Yeah, yeah, it really does. And isolation is the other one. And and you know what happens as you mentioned before when when the emotional intimacy isn't there, and what we talked about last time, and the spiritual intimacy isn't there, we can drift off into our own world mm-hmm. emotionally. And as you said, it's, it's it's isolating. It's not fun. You know, marriage encounter used to call this married singles. You know, <laughs> where, where uh, you're married but you're living a single life. You're living just two separate people in your own world and your own interests. Right. And with that, there's no. Uh, fun in being together you know there's no joy in being together it's just more of a duty something you have to do and you know we've all been through some seasons of that uh most of us not all of us but many of us i know i was we did then the joy of companionship when your hearts are connected you know it's just yeah. just great just to hang out just to do yeah. nothing and i didn't realize that until after margie's death how those little things were so important uh, just being in bed next to each other, not not right. talking about making love, just being in bed next to each other or sitting on the couch next to each other or sitting down and having a meal together, right. Right. Uh, sharing things with your family. There's so many things that right. are the day-to-day, you know, coming home to somebody. You know, the, yeah. the, the first time I, I remembered after Margie died, I was on my first trip after going away, and I mm-hmm. picked up my phone to call Margie wow. and all of a sudden realized she wasn't there. And it was, it was just this first thing I did when I got to a place. Right. And that's an example of companionship. It's like, who, who was I needing to call when I wow. landed somebody? And, you know, getting home to the empty house and not having her there to kiss and hug and say hi and be welcomed back. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, those things I didn't realize how important they were, uh, but they, they're, they're really the, the little daily moments of companionship that we take so for granted. You put it so well, take take for granted, because boy, did perspective come for you, you know? I mean, that, it's sad to hear you talk about that reality, um, and yet at the same time, what a blessing to all of us who still are married because I can sit there and go, Jake, don't take for granted. Cause I do, I do. I take for granted how often Heather and I actually connect. And then you, right, you, you miss it and you move past it. And it reminds me of, um, sorry, I'm going, I'm, I think my, I'm just so focused on woundedness right now that in my head, because I, I just, another kind of tip that I use for myself to give an indicator of when I'm off. And it, so it goes something like this when emotions are the thing that i'm using to interpret the health of our relationship something's wrong and that's a bad way to go about it when i'm oh this doesn't feel good enough so we're not in a good place heather's blah 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 um that's not a, that's not the indicator you know of what it's of a it's not the first indicator that we're supposed to use as to is heather actually this or am i whatever is how do i feel in it because that's exactly what the scripture was asking us to do was to don't be selfish to regard somebody as more important than yourself and if you struggle with selfishness maybe out of woundedness that isn't going to always be easy you know and then all these things that you do and you take for granted boy if if they're not there anymore that's a hard road, you know, because there's yeah. a lot that Heather and I do do that we combine or we connect and have companionship on that. I think it's just so normal to us. Right. That we don't that's, even notice it. That's the thing that I realized. It's just so normal. You right. know, I was looking at all the things we didn't have and not, not that I didn't appreciate what we had, but it was just like yeah. this, this deeper reality of the appreciation for all those little things. Again, boy, God have mercy on me. Because here, here's the question in my head, and I already leapt to an answer, which says a lot. And so um, playing together, you know, there's two kind of ways that you can kind of work in this area of companionship. And 
you know, on the chart, it's right in the middle. And I think that that's not, I don't think that's coincidence, you know, just it's, it's really important, the companionship, the friendship that you have in a marriage for it to remain healthy. And so working and playing together, you know, that's the encouragement. That's how it manifests. The first thing I thought was, yeah, like sports. And then I went, whoa, Jake, did you see how it's just <laughs> automatic, right? Yeah. I just went right there into that domain. But figuring out things that you both like to do together and um, where you, you both can actually play together. Um, and I think if you're coming, if you're in a marriage that's that's struggling, I think you have to be careful to, one, not try to fix the marriage by going on this super experience of play because sometimes you don't feel connected enough to have that work and so the simple consistent is usually way better than let's go to hawaii and learn how to surf or whatever mm -hmm. you know like that that might i mean maybe the both of you like that but there's a there's a caution i want to share there because a trip to hawaii doesn't all of a sudden make a marriage magically get better right it's the day-to-day -day consistency of of connection and companionship that's really valuable um is there any kind of tip or practical that you can think of, Bob, with regard to how to work and play together? Well, I think first, as you were mentioning, I think we need to go back to where those first two places, if we're not experiencing the friendship, the companionship, is go back to where is the emotional intimacy in trouble and where is the spiritual unity in trouble? Because if we have those two places as a foundation, then we're going to want to be together. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing at a practical level, you know, what we do in our marriage conference and I have in the book is mm -hmm. just a whole list of activities, yeah. uh, you know, and, and let's let's be conscious, let's be intentional about it. What are the things that we want to do together? And let me identify what I like and what you like and make a proposal and we come to something that we both like or we come to something that I want to do for you because I love you or with you mm. because I love you. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know that's could be simple as folding clothes together, yeah, uh, yeah, or taking care of the children, or preparing a meal, or working out in a garden, yeah, uh, or as silly as playing a game of cards. And you know, I had my grandchildren over the other day for a birthday sleepover, and we played a game of sorry, you know, which is a game yeah. since I've been kids. And yeah, we had it was right before they went to bed, and we had such a good time. We just kept getting each other right as we were getting ready to go home right. you know into the thing yeah. and just <laughs> just that fun companionship uh yes. and you know finding little ways like that just to do things hmm. that uh that you enjoy and and some of the joy is just being together you know if you're emotionally connected you just have joy yeah. uh I, I i think one of the things i missed the most was just holding margie's hand hmm. Uh, because we do that every day in one way or another, you know, and, and mm. just just to hold her hand uh, was a simple little thing uh, mm. that was neither play nor work, but it was companionship. Yeah. Wow. That's I mean, gosh, Bob, there's so many little things that you just take for granted. And I hope our listeners are hearing that of it's possible that there's a lot more companionship going on than you give your own marriage credit for. And I think I'm right there um, where I don't give Heather and I enough credit where I'm expecting, you know, I don't know, this everything, uh, we want to do everything together. You know, I think that's going too far the other direction. Um, a, a practical for Heather and I that worked really well, and this was kind of shocking to me because I realized how much my own heart had shut down and then how I was bringing a shut down heart into this area of companionship. You know, it's kind of hard to have fun with somebody who's, you know, Eeyore the donkey, just, mm -hmm. I don't want to do anything, you know? That doesn't really, that's hard to connect with, so God bless Heather, but one of the questions that you mentioned in the book uh, and the workbook at the marriage conference that we kind of adapted was, you know, you, you there was an encouragement to think about friendships you had as a kid, and so we adapted the question to, what did you love to do as a kid? And all of a sudden, I was like rejuvenated with life and I started talking about all these things and Heather just paused and went, where, where did this guy come from? You uh -huh. know, like he seems fun, you know, cause I just started sharing about, and we would do this and we would do this and all this uh -huh. excitement came back. And so it was a really cool, simple question to talk with each other about what did you love to do as a kid? Um, that you, how did you play as a kid? And 
it's not like some people, oh, I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore. I don't, whatever. And I'm thinking, well, as a kid, I'd play board games. What's wrong with playing a board game as an adult? Or I'd play cards or I'd play a sport or I'd, I'd play with my cousins a lot. And we were really close. I had a close group of cousin friends. Uh, well, they were actually my cousins, but they were more <laughs> like best friends. Um, and so all that just brought me back to how I would play. And it was like I'd forgotten how do you play again? You know, I'd gotten too almost old for my own heart in yeah, a way. Yeah. And so that question was really helpful for us about how to play. Uh, and I just started remembering and Heather's super easy going. So it was really cool for her. She'll go, sure, I'll do that. I'm like, what? You'll yeah, do that? Yeah. I love you. <laughs> that's right. That's, <laughs> right. How, that's how quickly it goes. That just right. bond, right? You yeah. care about what I'm interested in and you want to share it with me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was, yeah, it was really good. I think the other working, you know, when you say work side by side, I know work can be, a, for me, I'll say it can be a trigger because I just all of a sudden go, oh, hey, I got to work. I got to do yeah. stuff, right? And but Heather, um, it doesn't always go so well when I say let's work together because I go into, yeah, we're going to pull an eight-hour day and mm -hmm. no breaks. And, yeah. you know, the drill sergeant comes out, as Heather and my kids call it, you know, I'm like full on. It's boot camp. Get out there. Move it. Move it. You know, that doesn't work very well. That's not very fun. <laughs> but when we do something together that is work, like you mentioned, working in the garden or whatever, Heather and I just, uh, we built a home that we now live in. And that was, there was a lot of work there, mm -hmm. but there was also a lot of companionship where Heather, she's got uh, an art, incredible artistic eye for all this stuff. I think it's her HGTV experience, right? Mm -hmm. She's, she's like, she learns and she loves that stuff. But yeah, we we worked together on the house and it was awesome to now to then move in and go, we made these decisions, yeah, yeah. you know? And yeah, it was work at times, but it was really rewarding. They say if you survive building a house together, you've got a good marriage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I'll take it. <laughs> then I'll, I'll take it, man. Yeah, that was good. Any other thoughts there quickly about working together? Uh, and then maybe we'll move on to teamwork. I think as you're describing, it's, it's some of the attitude we have about work in a fallen world as opposed to work as God intended uh -huh. it. Uh -huh. you know. And so in a fallen world, work is uh, a drudgery mm -hmm. in some sense. Uh, but work as an engagement of my capacities to do something and to be productive and be fruitful, mm -hmm. uh, it could be anything. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, it's just building something together, doing something together, working on a project together, uh, accomplishing a task together, all that can be enjoyable companionship. Mm. Another quick tip that I found that, again, it's the stuff you take for granted, but don't stop doing it. Or if you aren't doing it, maybe consider doing it is, yeah, maybe I on a Saturday will go outside and do more outside than Heather will. And, and that's just how our, you know, I, I can't make a dinner and everybody's glad that I don't try, right? So we'll just, that's the case. And Heather's an amazing cook. And so just the power of a thank you uh, mm -hmm. when those things happen. Yes. You know, like Heather stepping outside to see what I've done and going, wow, thank you. This is awesome. You know, it does, seems small, but it goes That's a big. long That's way. That's big. Yeah. yeah. And we say, as a, and, and with the kids, I've... Um, a bit of drill sergeant trained them to do this is we say thank you to mom every single meal because boy don't take for granted and my oldest is about to go off to university and i'm kind of inside going oh girl you are gonna have a rude awakening to cafeteria food and <laughs> just yeah. you've gotten like a, a mom slash chef for your <laughs> for your whole life but boy your gratitude goes up you know and so in a marriage boy the the power of a simple Let's say that the husband or wife, doesn't matter who's the primary um, um, money maker, a thank you when they come home from work. Um, thank you for doing my laundry. Yes. Whomever does whichever task, you know? And that's moving us into teamwork because, you know, it's actually the complementarity of the relationship, you know, of I'm good at this, you're good at this. We're not the mm -hmm. same. We have these complementary areas, but how do we complement in a way? That we that we build teamwork as opposed to just go in opposite directions, and that's one of the ways. It's it's by really looking at and appreciating the gift of the other, and what they bring to the relationship, and and just being able to express it. Like you said, there's such a bond, and and somebody appreciating what we give. You know, it's yeah. it's not taken for granted. It's just 
it's just recognized and received and it, it really creates a teamwork. Yeah. And I think the other thing in that is recognizing we're doing this for each other mm-hmm. and for our children, you know, mm-hmm. all for the glory of God. But we're doing this not because I'm looking out for my own interest and you're looking out for your interests, but we're looking out for each other's interest here and the interests of the family. Right. I mean, I, I'm just thinking about it with regard to work because this is something that I can get locked into and and do too much of, you know. So, um, you know, complete my joy. I'm going back to the scripture. Complete my joy of being of the same mind in work, united in heart and work, thinking one thing in work or in play. Do nothing out of selfishness or vainglory in work. Whew, that's convicting. Uh, humbly regard your others as more important than yourself, right? So there, the scripture all of a sudden just starts popping to life when I apply a topic to it, right? So yeah. don't be you know, only thinking of yourself and work. I'm notorious for going, okay, just 10 more minutes and I can finish this one thing. And the whole family sitting at the dinner table waiting and, and Heather you know, she worked hard on a meal, making it hot and everything coming together at the same time, which if you cook, you know, that's not easy. Yeah. Um, and then, oh, just five more minutes. You know, that's really selfish, you know, because I could do it tomorrow. You know, I'm just trying to make myself feel okay. You know, so there's so many things here. But w- when we go to, well, I'm just looking at the chart here. And, and so if we jump to teamwork, what are the obstacles of teamwork? Stubbornness and control, like check and check. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've, got, I've got both of those down really well. Um, but it does, like that's the kind of thing that breaks up uh, teamwork. And, you know, Bob, you and I both come from an athletic background. We played a lot of team sports. And so it's funny because I get this, right? You don't have showboats or individual players on a team. They'll ruin the team. It's the same thing in a marriage. Yeah, I'm a a big Pittsburgh Steelers fan. A couple years ago, they had actually a better team in terms of players, but some of the guys were really self-oriented. And because the organization is the Rooney family and you know just strong Catholic hmm. orientation, they've been really loyal to their coaches and they choose character players most of the time. And so they let these really good players go hmm. because they were destroying the team. And now we have, I think, a lesser team and right. we're undefeated. Right. Uh and until the last loss. And yeah. You know, that that says a lot. It's just the principle of teamwork is mutual submission, is that right. we're we're not looking out for our own interests. We're looking out for each other. We're one heart, one mind. Right. And as we do that, we're going towards a common goal. Yes. Yes. I mean, you're talking about the, this is going to sound cheesy, but I, uh, teamwork makes the dream work. Right. You know, and like right. you hear, and yep. but if you break down the, if you, you know, scrape off all the cheesiness around that, but, and just think, yeah, teamwork does make our dream of a marriage work. And you said something a moment ago, Bob, I think that's just really cool, is the honoring of each other's strengths. And I think this is an area where Heather and I took this massively for granted, where Heather's an incredible cook. I, I'm I'm a high quality peanut butter and jam, right? I can nail that sucker, but that gets old really quick. You know, where I'm really good at details, detail oriented, and so life like, finances and filling out a form for your passport that those are really detail oriented heather just you know her head just kind of starts smoking out the side and mm-hmm. she can't do that where she's super spontaneous uh and can see the needs of the kids and people around her really well and i'm really i can be very goal oriented and get a lot of things done well when you start to put those together man we are a solid team like we are we're really good. It's just like you're saying with the Steelers, you know? Yeah, we're not the best at everything. We're not superstars, but man, we're, we're a solid team when you put us together. And I think the, the key to that is appreciating what the other offers and brings and blessing and honoring them for that and realizing that, yeah, you may just be doing all this other stuff, but if you only focus on yourself, we're back to selfishness yeah. and you're going to start taking yourself and your marriage out at the knees because... You're only thinking about yourself, and that's a great recipe for disaster in a marriage. Yeah, I've, I've recently uh, been blessed by the the work of Patrick Lencioni, who's you know probably the the best organizational consultant guy in the yeah. church, and yeah. uh, also very well respected in the world. Yeah. And 
he's helped us with our organization. And it was hard to realize how much we do independently without thinking of the team for each other. And as he was helping us identify those different aspects, I I began to apply all of it to marriage also. It's like they all fit. Everything at the organizational level fits at the marriage level. And it's that teamwork. It's that look at what are each of your gifts Right. And how do these work together? And he talks about the thing that kills teamwork more than anything else are three things. He said, it's pride. I'm looking out for myself and, and making a name for myself. Mm-hmm. It's uh, laziness, which mm-hmm. is I'm going to let you do it, and I'm just going to sit here and not do anything. Right. And the other one is is a lack of awareness, You know, a lack of mm-hmm. awareness of what each other brings and what each other needs. Right. I think all those right. apply to marriage. Oh, man. His book, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, you know, you could take those principles and make it five dysfunctions of a marriage real quick. Very yeah. easily, yeah. Yeah, and those, and I mean, it's something simple. I, I can't shake, uh, and, and your guys' marriage conference, Carrie, when she gave uh, her talk, and she talks about, and it's so sweet and cute, and that's just, I think, Carrie and Margie coming out through Carrie yeah. is uh, she said uh, there's nothing sexier than a man folding clothes, you know, <laughs> and it's just so it's so sweet and cute to to hear her say that, but but there's a really powerful principle there in that if you know you're sitting maybe the clothes get folded on the couch and um, you're watching a show and maybe it's the wife who folds the clothes and the husband's just sitting there, imagine getting up buddy and folding some clothes with her yeah man that could go a long way it's not like you know you have to do it or yeah you've worked hard but so has she so has she and then well that that's the thing i think for a lot of guys is is that now you're sexy man now your your sex appeal went up because you're folding clothes that's married life you know that's what makes a man sexy in marriage margie always used to joke her her father was very gifted at household repairs. I think we've mentioned this before, household repairs. Yeah. And I am very ungifted in that area. Yeah, me too. And so when I would screw in a light bulb, uh, just even something that simple or anything, yeah. anything that I would tend to that was part of her love language, which was right. service and right. and particularly around the home, right. uh, she would just want to be in bed with me. I mean, it was wow. really that strong. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And I didn't do it for that reason. I did it, be, right. you know, but it was just like, well, what's this? You know, yeah, like, I didn't yeah. do anything here. Yeah. <laughs> Is that, that's when you wore your extra tight shirt and put on your tool belt <laughs> and got out the light bulbs, right? Right, and got out the light bulbs. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. I hear you. Yeah. Um, and so we're talking about stubborn. I feel like we're balancing a bit of this stubbornness and control. You know, you're sitting there stubborn. It's not, I'm not going to, you know, fold the laundry or... On the flip side, you know, maybe there's a, a pocket of a season where the the husband does something or whatever. Like maybe he typically takes the car in for service. I don't know, and that could be an intimidating thing for women. At least I, I've I've heard Heather's expressed to me that that you know it's the classic place where pe- where women get taken advantage of in a way. Again, we're trying to avoid stereotyping here, um, but again, just giving examples, you know, but maybe there is a time where the wife has to step up and take the car and to get service. And because he's out of town on a trip or whatever, and, you know, instead of being bitter or resentful, just, yeah, I'm going to, I'm doing this for the family and blessing my husband. You know, he's probably stressed about this, but the oil needs to be changed. And, you know, uh, and then when the husband, you know, when he gets back, his job's not to figure out how she did it wrong, because that's often where it goes, is what? You didn't get them to change the air filter too, right? right? Come on, man. Like realize that she stepped out on a limb here and did this uncomfortable thing trying to bless you. And all you're going to do is point out what's wrong. Ah, that's not how it works. That's not that's not teamwork, you know? Amen. You don't yell at your guy running down the court because he he missed a layup, right? That's that's a That'll ruin a team. Yeah, that's yeah. your will. And, you know, the, the, the flip side of that is when we want our spouse to do something and they don't want to do it, and then Mm. we try to control them to do that, you know, either through guilt Mm. or through manipulation or through convincing or through pouting or whatever it is, uh, that's just equally destructive. It it has to come in freedom Mm. from the other person. You know, the more haranguing there is, 
about you don't do this and you don't do this. It's the opposite of appreciation. You know, it's the right. very antithesis of that. And that becomes control, which meets with its stubbornness. You know, it's like those two play off of each other. Control on one side, stubbornness on the other. Yes. Whereas, uh, you know, the scripture we talked about earlier about looking out for each other's interests is a mutual submission. It's 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 looking out for God's interests in our marriage, mm -hmm. and then we're submitting our will. So we're not using control and manipulation. We're just submitting to what's for the good of the other. Yes. Again, a, a bit of a cheesy cliche sh statement, but boy, is it ever true. Like if you want to have a good if you want to have a good marriage, get used to and love the taste of humble pie. Mm -hmm. Because large doses of humility on both sides goes a long, long, long way. And, you know, I know some people are probably in really difficult marriages, you know, and maybe one of the spouses is just totally shut off and they're rock hard, cold, and, and you know, that's not easy. And so, you know, if that's your, if that's the case, you know, we, the, the chart kind of gives a path in a sense of let's go back to the unification that comes in spiritual unity, right? And maybe all you're capable of doing right there is praying for them and praying for yourself and praying for the grace to have God's will be done. And the heroicness of those little actions that come out when the other person's a complete, you know, fill in the blank with whatever expletive you'd like. But if they're that, the, the, power of that is is incredible you know where they're them laying their lives down is on a whole other level you know because they're kind of being um figuratively spit upon you know when they're offering their life and um yeah that's hard i just want to acknowledge that that's really hard but it doesn't have to be the end of the story you know no. a lot of times there's broken hearts are underneath broken marriages you yeah. know yeah. Wounded children are often underneath broken marriages. Yeah, and if that's your situation and you're listening to this, uh, we've already discussed that the series we're going to do after this is on healing and restoring in, in the areas of marriage. So we're talking about how to build right now, but recognizing that some of you don't have the capacity to build because there's some pretty severe brokenness in the relationship. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, I mean, Heather and I are very open with this, that we regularly go to marriage counseling. Um, and that's not because, you know, our marriage is like hanging on by a thread, but there've been times where that's been the case. And so we've just realized that having a spot and a place with a person that we both trust is a wonderful thing to continue to work. And he, hey, marriage isn't easy, you know, and it uh, to me, it's the great saint maker. If you want to be a saint, get married. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great way to be a saint, and yeah, that's what we're about. You know that for Heather and I, we are unified there. That I want to be holy, and that it, marriage is awesome for that. And then once you start actually becoming holy, it starts to get really wonderful. You know, yeah. it can be really great as your own heart heals, and you know that's the path we're trying to lay out for people. Yeah, and with that, uh, you were talking before uh, before we started about. Uh, the common vision. So I think it's a good place to to bring yeah. that in. Yeah, you know, I mean, one of the areas of teamwork that I think really is valuable is when you when you unify around a vision and you unify around what we're all about. And um, you know, Heather and I, ever since we got married, have been all about bringing people into an intimacy and an encounter with the Lord. And we do that in different ways, but that is our vision. And that, you know, that's what we're about. Our whole life has been, our whole married life has been about that. And it's really cool because we bless one another when the other one's doing something that, you know, of, of bringing people into that. We run ideas past each other all the time. I would say the best talks I've ever given are talks that Heather actually gave me 80% of the content. You know, it's mm -hmm. just coming out of that space and place where we're unified um, and what we're all about. Now, we have some friends that are just really inspirational. Now they're your classic couple where, you know, one of them, uh, the wife's, a, she's a stay at home mom and the husband, he's got a finance job. They couldn't have kids for a, quite a while um, and a long time. So what they decided to do was adopt. And so they adopted one child and we were, you know, we've been with them kind of in this whole, they're like one of some of our closest friends. And then they adopted a second child because they couldn't have children of their own. And then they decide to adopt two sisters coming out of a broken, um, like a mentally ill home 
So in Canada, it's called the Ministry of Child and Youth Mental Health. So, you know, kids that were about to be taken away from their parents, they adopted these two girls. One of those girls, Heather and I are the godparents for, and man, their family's just, it's incredible. And then you know what happened? They had their own biological child as number five, and they're still open. They're still open to adopting another. And so we were out to dinner with them uh, recently, and it was amazing when they were just sharing the possibility of adopting another kid, just the possibility. And the husband said something that was amazing. He said, well, that's what my family's about. That's what we are about. And you could see her just light up because she loves that they're so unified in that. And that is their vision. That's what their family is. And they're an incredible testimony to a lot of people about the generosity. You know, these kids' lives are radically changed because of their generosity. And he he has said, that's what we're about. It was beautiful and strong mm-hmm. and cool to hear him say that. And man, their teamwork is really, really clear there. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that that's such a unifying force that helps to repair the other areas of the relationship because it's like this is stronger than everything else. I mean, Bob, you just said where I was about to go because they're both of their relationships with God. I've watched them get stronger and stronger as the vision in their marriage was settled and strong. Like it was a pillar. And I've, I've seen him grow a lot in his prayer life. And it's amazing. And I think it's just some of the fruit of maybe another pocket in their marriage going well. And now the spiritual unity that they have has gone up and now their generosity and vision gets more expansive. It's just, it's beautiful and powerful to see. Yeah, that's neat. And I like what you're highlighting there, which is these, how these things flow together. They're not separate things. They're all right. interconnected. Yeah. So Bob, any final thoughts before we uh, wrap up for today? I like what you said about these are in the middle. You know, these are in between the spiritual intimacy or spiritual unity and emotional intimacy on one hand and the sexual intimacy on the other. We're going to go to sexual intimacy next. Yeah. This is really critical uh, as the bridge between those two places. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, yeah, so much intimacy comes in the bedroom because you're you're close friends and you're on a common vision and mission. Yeah. You know, like it's just really powerful. So, yeah. well, thanks for being with us and thanks for listening. Um, we hope that you enjoyed this episode. Maybe you want to share it with a friend or maybe with a couple. And, you know, we, we've heard that some people are actually starting to listen to the episodes in small groups and break them down. I mean, this would be a cool thing. I know Heather and I used to be a part of a marriage couples group where we'd all get together and we were always looking for content. So the, go through this series maybe as a, as a group of couples and then share it. We have reflection questions and things that we include in the show notes and other ways for you to kind of break it open a bit more. So maybe you'd do that. And, you know, as you know, you can find these episodes on iTunes or other places that you find podcasts, but maybe your friends don't. So you could point that out to them. You can also go to our website and sign up to receive the episodes directly to your inbox. And that website is restoretheglorypodcast.com. And until next time, we pray that you would continue to experience the abundance of God's love, mercy, and healing.